Climate change is expected to worsen the frequency, intensity, and impacts of extreme weather events. Increasing risk and extent of wildfires, widespread droughts, as well as species extinction. As Canadian author Margaret Atwood once said, "It's not climate change; it's everything change." And how does agricultural land respond to climate change? Corn production in the U.S. is dominated by the Great Plains of Central United States, the Corn Belt. The Corn Belt, roughly including 12 states, is one of the most fertile regions, producing more than 10 billion bushels of corn each year. Corn yield trends are positive across the Corn Belt. As darker yellow indicates of more production of corn, we could obviously observe that the centuries of the corn production is moving northwest over the last 50 years. In the highlighted area, mostly in the north part, the yield has increased by over 100 percent. The shifting of yield centuries is mainly because of the changing climate. As climate warms, plant hardy soon. Which tracks average low temperature in winter are moving north in the U.S. at 13 miles per decade. As the most important crops in Corn Belt, corns and soybeans are planted in plant hardy zone five and six. However, since the plant hardy zone is shifting north, while the more suitable conditions for commodity crops. May shift northward to states like Minnesota and Dakotas. The climate model shows a similar prediction. It predicts a rise in average temperature, which will affect crop growth. According to the Hurley three model, area weighted average yields are predicted to decrease by 30 to 46 percent by the end of this century, under the slowest warming scenario. And by 63 to 82 percent under the most rapid warming scenario. Both the shifting of plant hardy zone and the climate prediction model indicate that climate change will probably push corn growth regions north. It is expected to be new corn agriculture in northern states, and the southern part of the Corn Belt is vulnerable due to higher temperature. To maintain the agricultural production in southern Corn Belt, farmers may change the crop type to adapt to climate change. Cotton, for example, is currently dominant in Cotton Belt, in the plant hardy zone seven and eight. As the weather gets warmer, it is likely that the Corn Belt would grow cotton as an adaptive crop in the future. However. By comparing the corn distribution of 2010 and 2021, there is no obvious change indicating the corn belt moving north spatially, which is contradictory to the prediction and climate model. The land use of the corn belt remains stable. There is even an expansion of agricultural land due to higher corn price in recent years. A study of the migration pattern in the agricultural regions. Which reported to be under climate pressure also shows that there is no significant trend of farmers moving north. As the yellow and green color representing people moving north and south, it seems that climate change hasn't shown an effect on people's moving pattern. As models are predicting the Corn Belt is moving north, despite being aware of this prediction, why aren't farmers moving north as well? As we can see, vast acreage of corn and soybeans are watered by central pivot irrigation in western Corn Belt states, changing a near desert region into the largest agricultural region in the U.S. Irrigation and evaporation create microclimate to reduce the temperature and heat effect. The spatial distribution of changes in irrigated acreage reports a decrease in western United States, and as shown in blue. An increase 
of irrigation is concentrated midwest, especially in Corn Belt. Where surface water supplies are insufficient, groundwater is often used for irrigation. Agriculture uses about 53% of groundwater pumped for human use in the U.S. Taking advantage of this incredible amount of water resources provided by Oglaha Aquifer, there has been significant crop production for decades in the 12 states Corn Belt region. Its water supports 35 billion in crop production each year. While these regions are now under more and more severe water stress, as the Oglaha Aquifer will be depleted and ultimately exhausted. Once depleted, the aquifer will take over 6,000 years to replenish naturally through rainfall. More than 90% of the water pumped is used to irrigate crops. Among them, Nebraska is the biggest consumer, taking 46% of the annual pumping water from the Oglaha Aquifer. The number of irrigation wells in Nebraska has exploded from 100,000 to 250,000 registered irrigation wells since the 21st century and additional of 16,000 registered water wells. The false color satellite images concentrated in a dense wells area shows the spread of central pivot irrigation in Nebraska. The bright red colors shows healthy vegetation with irrigation in this false color composition. The story happening in western Corn Belt states like Nebraska could be the coming future for the whole Corn Belt. Researchers find states in corn belts and Great Lakes, where corn growth is primarily fed by rainfall, would be subject to move intense but less frequent precipitation. Maintaining crops will require 5 to 25 percent increase in irrigation, which would in turn require more extensive and expensive water catchment infrastructure. However, as the temperature keeps rising in the coming future, it is likely that more than half of the Corn Belt states would have to use irrigation to fed crops, leading to more depletion of aquifer in the Corn Belt besides Agualaha Aquifer. Irrigation may be useful in the short term. Researchers find that crop yields will decline even if irrigation continues to be applied as needed. As we could see that irrigation is unsustainable and costly, it's more like an attempt to fight with the honey zone, changing the microclimate and trying to keep the zone 6 as it is through irrigation. Why do people still keep investing on irrigation? Government payments could be direct support. Massive government payments to farmers hide behind huge water consumption. Federal subsidies increased by a remarkable of 65% in 2020, totaling $37.2 billion. Corn prices were too low to cover the cost of growing in that year, with federal subsidies making up the difference. The subsidies put farmers on a treadmill, working harder to produce more while draining the resource that supports their livelihood. Government payments create a vicious circle of overproduction that intensifies water use. Subsidies encourage farmers to expand and buy expensive equipment to irrigate larger areas. Subsidizing corn production is supporting the U.S. economy. 16 separate sectors, from fast food companies to fertilizer manufacturers to grocery retailers, depends on U.S. corn as a key ingredient of their products or as a market for their inputs and services. In 2013, the top 45 companies in the corn value chain earned $1.7 in revenue, 
more than the value of Australia's annual GDP. However, we may also find that even these hidden upstream companies are also looking for longer-term strategy. Companies like Cargill, ADM, and Bunge, which are the magnets of the coal manufacturing industry, is buying land all over the world. ADM, for example, is related to collection, processing, and manufacturing of coins. With headquarters in Chicago, ADM now has processing and procurement branches all over the world. According to the data from Land Matrix, ADM is purchasing land in Africa and Asia. 14 international land trades are completed with the total deal size of over 4 million hectares. With the trend that big companies in the US are purchasing land worldwide, we have reasons to believe that North might not be the only destination for Corn Belt. It's more likely that the US Corn Belt will be international in 50 years.